it just seems like something but it's not. And if you think the model in is toxic or salty, then please play any other game because you have no right to enjoy this beautiful game. Oh man, I just love that view. I love this little town. There's another priest, and uh, what is this? Oh man, oh man, it looks like religion. Okay, okay, back off. Okay, okay, I'm not <laughs> religion. I hate religion. <laughs> that wall looks not so good. Uh, just a little bit, um, oh, really? Yeah, Come on, man. Looks like a pretty good little smithy here. Just had to be a ranger, it's, huh? Uh, one thing that was gonna kill me. Come on. Come on, Animage. Great, great. Dirty, but it's okay. Up here you have the second entrance. When you go that way, you will encounter a few bamboo spawns, I think. And maybe you will find a few spider spawns. They are currently not in game, but I guess um, Star Wars will implement the same spawns like in Mortal Kombat 1. Not exactly the same, but nearly at the same basis. This is the Karnish Bank. I love the bank discussion here. And it's very safe because there's just a door that you can't open. So all your precious items My God. are really safe in that bank. And uh, the bank is also run by twins, if you haven't seen that. Okay, well, let's look to the main crafting stations. And first off, in this hostel, he looks like Chad to me. And he reminds me of someone. Oh. No, I have it. He, he nearly looks like Henry. Fuck me. He looks like Henry. Oh my Fuck god. Fuck it's, it's too far. I seen that before, man. Anyway, let's take a deeper look at the hostel. Yeah, for one gold or something it would be okay, but uh, more it would be really overpriced. And now to one of my favorite things, the crafting stuff. So here's the weapon crafting table. Oh, that looks like pretty nice axes and stuff and hammers. And on the right corner of the magic we have the armor crafting table. And to the left we have the bow crafting table, of course. Say no to each other. What do we have here? Nice shields, nice viking shields, or whatever shields, or every shield that you can craft. I wonder uh, when the big Roman shields come into the game. Oh, well, this building has a second floor, and nice. Um, looks the same as, what the fuck? No one, really no one would build a house like that, with, uh, with stairs outdoors. I mean, seriously, if you build an open space into a house, and you separate the entrance, why? Why should someone on earth do that? Now we are back at the entrance and we look at the ground level. I really like the look of the city because just imagine having uh, fights here with a lot of people on these bridges and everywhere and in this little... what what... Oh yeah, nice! That was a tavern I saw a few months ago. Man, this tavern is awesome. We should make parties here. That looks amazing. Can I climb? No, no, I still can't climb. Yeah, but no problem, I'm just walking over here because here you can jump a little bit on the ladders and you can see what is up there and um, yeah, I, I can't go any further. But it's pretty nice in here. Also the lighting and the shadows is pretty good. And it would be awesome if this door leads to something. I always wanted to be a bartender. I'm a German from Bavaria and our babies get alcohol before they get water. Okay, not for real, but the really drinking <laughs> age is like 10 years so old. Your parents allow that. You can drink legally if you are 16. Some countries would say, what the fuck? But I would say... It's I wish America was like that. Efficient. So yeah, work hard, party hard. And now for the little NPCs, we have the grocery vendor and the utility vendor, of course. I mean, a utility vendor is needed all the time. Then you have like this uh, butcher shop, I don't know uh, what NPC will stand there. And we have also a cooking vendor. That is pretty awesome because we also have a lot of alchemy operations in Cornish. Right down this little rabbit hole, you can find the region vendor and also the alchemy table, a few books, a few tiles, pretty nice decorations. Here's the big lake. The glory fabricola for tungsten production and stuff, and also of course the metals for the heavy metals. I wonder why we just salt the map again. But now let's look to our MVP. The Medal of Honor goes to the region vendor because without region vendor we wouldn't have anything at all. So props and respect to that guy, please. Okay, and now we're just uh, running back to the entrance slowly, enjoying the view in Kranich of uh, this old stones and nice textures and broken car wheels and wagons and uh, 
Barons. I'm just wondering if the Kranich kids will uh, play here again or not. My friend uh, Vios, the uh, general is in the description, had many PvP fights here in Kranich. I wonder how many PvP will take place here. And I'm also curious which people will live here, which guilds are controlling this area, and who will fight for law and order or total destruction here in Kranich. Don't forget to like and subscribe to support me on Patreon. Yeah, it was good. Thank you, uh, Wolfsack, for the excellent content for my stream. I'd like to sub to your channel. <clears throat> um, I need the map. Okay, so on the other fat side of the river south, down there is a... Like, I'm kind of curious to see if I can walk down the bottom of the, 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 the lake. Yeah, let's see. And just cut directly across. There's the bridge. There, there's Kranesh, which is a good way to find it, you know. I was going to move to a lawless town anyways, so. Because I'd rather rob people in this game. I'd rather rob people in this game than... Uh, Then uh, farm and all that. it is okay so this is a good way to understand how, how the layout is it was when you're dead but yeah cool I got Grenache Yeah, I'm gonna set this as home until I make it back to fucking Tindrum, because I'm locked out of Tindrum for some weeks, because I murdered that guy. So dumb. But hey, we have a new town to mess with, and I'll make a living here for a while. It looks de dead, which frankly to me is like heaven. If it's dead, that's a good thing. Here's a crafting librarian. That's good, because I might need to buy books. There's Grenesh Banker. Let's see if there's different music here. Uh, I'm standing on this crystal and it's annoying. Okay, so... Refining oven, weapon crafting table, armor crafting table. Decoration vendor. Fishing vendor, which is good. Because there's a river around. Could do some fishing here. That's good. Uh, magic vendor. Uh, oh, let's turn on the music, right? Settings, audio, music. Uh, I'm going to check my title and make sure that I'm listed right. Eve Online, Caves of Code. Instead of Caves of Code, we're going to say 
EVE Online Mortal 2. And then we will say done. And we will go out there to go hunting. We shall go hunting today. We shall take tigers to fight flies and such. Tiger versus fly. Tiger versus goblin. Goblin versus your mom. Goblin on, goblin on your mom's knob or whatever. Looking for a tiger. There's a tiger. How did you resist off the bat, damn it? Fine, fine fuck it. You know, I want to try... No, go to one, damn it. I want to try this. Fuck it. There. Take this to the other screen. Okay, so I think what there are, you know, yeah, if you if you have a special that you you know in the game and you're looking for a special place to to come and you know, and, you know yeah, spend some special time with that uh, special someone. Kingdom Garden. You can't go wrong with Kingdom Garden. It's, it's just a really great Oh, God. So, the Kunesh guy was good, but we're done with it. Let's see what else he has to say. It's a great place for that kind of thing. But I also just want to take this time to just uh, remember uh, just some... Just, just Let's go back. The razor fan crawl, no American. You got carried. Oh my god. This is five hours long. bear said his name wrong which led him to have a change soon to be known as Christina when she transitioned to be a woman but online trolls call them thief I, I, I want everything about my house off the internet oh, this is Christian God. Weston Chandler previously known as Christopher before an animatronic bear said his name wrong which led him to have a change soon to be known as Christina when she transitioned to be a woman but online trolls call them Chris Chan He's demanding a video showing his hoarding situation be taken off the internet so that his elderly parents won't have their house condemned by the government. Who would report them? Well, that would be a dedicated group of internet users who have cataloged this man's life for the past 15 years, making him one of the most well-documented people in human history with his wiki containing thousands of pages. This includes a Nickelodeon cartoon character stealing his girlfriend, a doppelganger trying to steal his identity, him being catfished by a dozen different women, the destruction of his PlayStation 3 for a fake bounty, money stolen from his bank account, his house catching on fire, the macing of GameStop employees, running over a store owner with his car, getting tricked by the creator of the Super Mario Brothers, and having a character <laughs> Sonic Chew is stolen by a British sports commentator. Sonic Chew is a hybrid of Sonic and Pikachu that Chris created an entire comic series for. This character is also his real-life alter ego that he believes will one day bring about an interdimensional merge that will reveal him to be the reincarnation of Jesus. <coughs> but I think I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the beginning. <coughs> So 
for years now, people have been asking me to do a video talking about Chris Chan, and the problem is I just never knew where to begin on the subject. So for the past month now, I've been trying to get in touch with Chris Chan in any way I could. Uh, but after all that failed, I messaged Poppish. He responded right away and asked me to interview with Chris Chan, and the answer to that was absolutely yes. So within a few days, I get a cameraman, and I am heading down a couple hours, making a road trip out of it, to meet the notorious Chris Chan in person. And this is the street. to his birth, Chris's parents' relationship gave many reasons for concern. Bob and Barbara Chandler were aged 54 and 40 respectively. At this later time in a couple's life, most are dissuaded by medical professionals from having children. This is for a variety of reasons. As many studies have shown, such an age difference would leave a large generational gap between parent and child. In some cases, this can put the child at risk of growing up socially stunted, as from a biological standpoint, they also have a larger chance of facing health complications at birth. More specific to the Chandlers as individuals, however, was the hastiness of their relationship. Prior to Chris's birth, the two had been married for only two years. They lived quickly in a business of their previous marriages. Consequently, they held strange relationships with their previous families with Barbara's in particular being intense. Additionally, they were both alcoholics, having even first met each other in a bar. Of course, that's not to say that their family <coughs> was doomed from the start. In spite of these imperfections, it was far from unsalvageable. But these details are important in establishing that from their newborn's conception, it was an uphill battle. Such a dynamic requires a consistent and active effort to maintain normalcy one that the Chandlers may have not been ready to face. Christopher Weston Chandler was born in Charlottesville, Virginia on February 24th, 1982. In those first few months of life, Chris was an average toddler. His first word, according to his mother, was monkey, a rather cute mispronunciation of mommy. However, it wasn't long before problems would arise. To start, in spite of having a newborn child, they continued their nightly routine of going out drinking. To babysit Chris, as well as his half-brother Cole, who lived with them at the time, they appointed Rochelle, a woman who lived in the same neighborhood as the family. Chris's sibling later recalled that it was apparent to him, even as a youngster, that she was unfit to be caring for children. As the story goes, one night in August of 1983, Rochelle became irritated with Christopher after he interrupted her phone call. She opted to punish the toddler by locking him in a room by himself for the rest of the night. Christopher, who was just one and a half years old at the time, was traumatized to the point that when he was rescued, he refused to speak entirely. In fact, he regressed to the point of only communicating and screaming and crying for the next six years. 
To compensate for this newfound enthusiasm, his parents began taking him to attend speech therapy classes, which is where he was first diagnosed as being autistic, with the doctor predicting that he would likely never write his own name, let alone make it through high school. In a strange twist of events, Bob and Barbara would continue leaving Christopher with the delinquent babysitter for the next few years, likely so they could continue their tradition of late night benders. This led his stepbrother, Cole, to attribute Chris's early muteness as largely being the fault of their neglect, a trend that would only worsen with time. Though the assertion that neglect was the source of his autism is baseless, the babysitter's supposed actions undeniably exacerbated Chris's condition. And in spite of its immediate consequences, they failed to take many basic preventative measures. In 1985, a new family moved into the Chandler's neighborhood. With a child of their own, the families quickly became cordial with each other. This naturally led to Christopher becoming playmates with the couple's daughter, Sarah Hammer. Chris has a fond view of the years he spent with Sarah, reflecting upon them by proclaiming her to be a lifelong best friend. Unfortunately, the young girl would often pull mean-spirited pranks on the autistic child. An example of this was when she once convinced Chris that the cartoon character, Casper the Friendly Ghost, lived in the crawl space under her home. Once the young boy had crawled under the residence to look for himself, she proceeded to lock him in, trapping Chris until her father came to the rescue. While one could argue that events such as these implicate her as a foe, Chris insists far more positive than negative experiences. He dismissed them as just childish pranks, overshadowed by his cherished memories of them playing. According to Chris himself, it was her that brought him out of his autistic social shell for the time. At home, Christopher's life was surrounded by music and pop culture. Unable to speak, he spent much of his time consuming children's entertainment such as Sesame Street, Care Bears, and Transformers. Bob even purchased a Commodore 64 home computer, sparking Chris's lifelong interest in technology and video games. His father was proud of Chris for being able to operate the personal computer before he could even speak, programming his own games on the console by age six. Accompanying the Chandlers was their pet dog, Patty, who Chris had picked out himself from his aunt Karina's litter. At this point, his home life wasn't perfect, but it was comfortable. Unfortunately, things would only get worse when he began to attend school. The year was 1987, when he was oh, that's good. the good. front door you can buy a horse. That's good. primary school. With Chris's struggles to communicate, this marked the beginning of many obstacles he'd have to overcome in his academic career. In spite of this, Bob was optimistic. In order to inspire his son, he penned a heartfelt letter detailing his expectations. The reason for this open letter to you, which will grow as time goes on, is that I know now that I, at best, have as much time left to share myself with you, particularly to share my things, my dreams, and my thoughts with you at a time in the future when we will be able to understand. Remember to use my things and carry on my dreams if you want to. A distinct characteristic of the letter is that it's written informally. It's meant to be read as if he and Chris were speaking face to face. A clearly intimate discussion. Bob goes on to explain personal matters such as his previous marriages and what he sought to avoid when raising Chris. I didn't plan my life. I just took it as it came along. I seem to have had no control over it. It always came along with what was right for me. Look at me eight years ago in 1979 when I was really down and out and ready to cash in my chips with heart problems that I didn't even know about. Your mother, Barbara Ann, helped me through the rough spots and together we had easy. Now I really had something to live for. No better things or events could have happened to me. We've come a long way in the last eight years. Together we have built a whole new life with an exciting set of dreams. But by far the most important message Bob wanted Chris to take away was the importance of legacy. He recounts the story of how he carelessly broke his late grandfather's straight razor, an item that held great sentimental value to him, and how it caused him to realize the respect he ought to hold for their memories. From this, he hoped his son would cherish any future inherited belongings he might be given by his father, such as his prize stamp collection. Do not be in such a hurry to use, play, or work with these things. 
first to learn all about it, how to use them and enjoy their value, and how you can thoughtlessly waste their value, then enjoy them as I have. As a boy, my brother. Oh, there's a, there's a tray broker. Cool. All of my books, stamp collections, and records. My dreams for you, your mother, and other personal things. This idealized new life he wished to build with Chris and Barbara would culminate in the backyard of the Chandler's house. In 1989, Bob created a plaque and placed it on their backyard shed, proclaiming it as the dreaming studio of Mr. C and Bill C. It's here that he'd attempt to teach Chris how to create things. Evidently, the dreaming studio didn't last long enough to make a true impact on Chris, though. Because in spite of the clear sentimental value Bob placed on his belongings, Chris would later sell his father's cherished stamp collection in 2017, using the profits to purchase toys. While on the subject of games, when examining the Chandler's Christmas of 1989, it can be discovered that Christopher received a Nintendo Game Boy from Santa, his second ever video game console. It was that same year that the young boy purportedly began speaking again with the help of his speech therapist. By age seven, Chris had defied the professional's original expectations of him, an accomplishment that he'd wear with pride for the rest of his academic career. Soon after regaining his voice, for unknown reasons, Christopher was transferred from Green County Primary School to Nathaniel Green Elementary to attend the fourth grade. Although he was still riding off the success of regaining his speaking abilities, the administrators at this new school were not as impressed. While we'll never know for sure what happened there, legal documents indicate that the district had attempted to place him at a separate special education school, a decision that Bob and Barbara fought tooth and nail. It's speculated that they felt Chris's recent successes proved he didn't need the accommodations. Additionally, given their advanced age, they likely had a different perception of special ed than what was offered at the time. Regardless, the parents escalated the conflict. Chris recounts his experience at the school as one of frequent physical abuse, notoriously recalling an incident in which five facility members, including the school principal, pinned him down to the floor and recorded his cries on an audio cassette tape. Chris attributes this alleged assault to having been motivated by lust, going so far as to accuse the principal of being a pedo. He claims that the man had him sit on his lap before whispering quote-unquote offensive things to the young child. However, given the details that the alleged assault was recorded, some have speculated it's much more likely that Chris had thrown a tantrum, and facility members recorded his cries as evidence that he couldn't function in a mainstream institution. Upon learning of the incident, Bob filed legal action against the administration, causing Chris to be homeschooled during the proceedings. The case was eventually dropped in 1994. At this point, with the young boy's mainstream enrollment still in jeopardy, Bob and Chris moved to Chesterfield County so they could legally attend a different school district. This forced Bob to retire, becoming a stay-at-home father. In order to continue working her job, Barbara remained at their home in Rutgersville, though she would come to visit them every weekend. The decision to keep Chris in public school is perhaps the single most significant turning point regarding his early development. The failure to provide accommodations for his special needs led to feelings of ostracization and appeared to hinder Chris's social development. Jumping forward to the Christmas season of 1992, Bob and Chris made a stop at the Regency Square Mall. At this shopping center was an animatronic creature named Leonard Bearstein, who conducted a symphony orchestra as part of a musical program. The animatronic was designed to be interactive, engaging with the audience in conversation through its human operator. The crowd was light that Thursday afternoon, causing Christopher to be able to have a largely one-on-one -on -one conversation with the robot between songs. Chris was spellbound, leading him and Bob <laughs> to watch the performance for the next hour. In the midst of their conversation, Leonard Bearstein asked Christopher for his name. When Chris responded, the operator must have misheard him, as he began referring to the child as Christian. Following that interaction, the mistake stuck, with Chris going so far as to request his name be changed from Christopher to Christian. Oddly enough, Bob and Barbara agreed, and had it legally changed the following year. 
With this brand new first name bestowed upon him by an animatronic bear, the now adolescent boy continued his education at Providence Middle School in the fall of 1993. He later described this campus as being much more pleasant than Nathaniel Green and attributes his happiness there to a teacher named Mrs. Sanford who is to date the only educator that Chris has singled out favorably. She helped the child develop social skills and instructed him on how to cope with the verbal bullying he endured. Upon his graduation from Providence, Mrs. Sanford wrote a personal letter addressed to Chris, in which she gave him heartfelt advice and bid her well wishes. If you show people where your weak points are located, then they will know how to push your buttons. If you never show them, they will never know. Do your very best at Manchester, put your best foot forward, and treat others as you wish to be treated. Love, Mrs. Sanford. Of all the pop culture movements in the 90s, one of the most prominent was the mascot with attitude trends. And the most notable example of this was Sega's Sonic the Hedgehog. Debuting in 1991, the blue blur is most notable for his extreme speed. Made specifically to appeal to Western markets, the character was a massive success, quickly receiving his own syndicated Saturday morning cartoon in 1993. To promote the release of this new TV series, Sega hosted a contest known as the Sonic the Hedgehog Watch and Win Sweepstakes, in which they challenged viewers to write down what Sonic said at the end of each episode. Upon mailing in their transcriptions, they would then be entered into a drawing, where they'd have a chance to win a thousand dollar shopping spree at KB Toys. As an early adopter of the Sonic craze, Christian entered the contest, and as luck would have it, when the winners were selected in February of 1994, he actually won. The channel was exactly Watch Sonic the Hedgehog, a cartoon, and had written that what Sonic says at the end of it, and write it down for a whole week, and then I had to mail it in, and I had to be drawn out of a hat, and I just won. This victory marked the beginning of Christian's obsession with Sonic, who would go on to become his professed lifelong hero. And after the high of this spending spree, it wouldn't be the last time he entered the contest. By the spring of 1996, the family was once again together as Barbara retired from her job to live with her husband and son in Chesterfield County. This wouldn't last long, however, as according to Chris, some of their neighbors began spreading harmful rumors regarding the family. While what happened has never been specified, the situation was apparently vitriolic enough to cause them to relocate to an apartment complex just outside of Richmond. But being immersed in his pop culture pastimes, Chris was largely unfazed by these developments. It was that September that Christian finally began his first year at Manchester High a period he would retrospectively deem the happiest times of his life. At this school is where the creation of his very first Sonic the Hedgehog fan character, Bionic the Hedgehog, was conceived. Spending much of his freshman year as a water boy for the varsity basketball team, <laughs> he came up with the character after being hit in the head with a basketball while he was daydreaming about Sega's game mascot. It is, rather fittingly, an orange recolor of Sonic that likes to play sports. This ninth grade year would also mark the beginning of his passive love quest, developing a major crush on a cheerleader he met during practice. After befriending the young lady, he quickly confessed that he had feelings for her, to which she politely turned him down. In contrast to his time at Providence, Chris's years at Manchester High were filled with far more conflict. In sophomore year, Christian was forcibly assigned to take the special education bus after a petty conflict with another student. According to Chris, he and another teen would race every day to see who could exit the vehicle first. This competition it's escalated, Chris. eventually accumulating in the boy punching Chris in order to beat him out the door. However, like many of Chris's recollections from this period, what actually occurred is rather unclear. Across his various recountings of the bus incident, Chris has contradicted himself numerous times. He claimed that he both did and didn't fight back and also went back and forth on whether or not his glasses had been broken. What has remained consistent, however, is his adamance that he was blameless. He bemoaned that in spite of instigating the fight, the other boy, quote unquote, got off scot-free. Regardless of the truth, it was because of this conflict that he was removed from the mainstream busing system. 
and forced to ride with who he rudely described as the slow in the mines. At this point, it's worth discussing Chris's particular distaste towards the developmentally disabled, one that illustrates the ableism instilled in him by his parents. It's clear at this age, Chris uncritically took the words of authority figures to heart. In what are typically the years of rebellion for most teens, Chris was remarkably obedient. This can be observed rather transparently in his first self-produced video titled Song of Christian. In this clip, Chris goes on multiple tangents about grievances he holds with his peers, such as their use of vulgar language. I feel like I'm, I feel like now I'm talking about those despicable rude words they got down in there. self-produced recordings. As Christian entered his junior year, the maturity one would expect from a high school student didn't seem to be developing. In a mock radio broadcast, Chris recorded for fun, his mother humors him as if he's a child, while he pretends to have guests such as Alvin and the Chipmunks on the program. Of his time at Manchester High, 11th grade has the most documentation. Recovered assignments illustrate how he performed at school and the actual quality of his work against the grades he received. One of the first leaked projects is dated October 29th to 1998. Intended to be an icebreaker activity for his chemistry class, Chris notably refused to talk to any male students, leaving all their spaces blank. In spite of his woes of loneliness, things weren't entirely hopeless. It was in that class he would become lab partners with two female students, Kelly Andes and Sarah Bevel. They would be some of his first quote-unquote gal pals a term Chris later coined to describe all of his female friends. Chris has reasoned that his autism test found that he got along better with women rather than men. Chris's gal pals would make up the entirety of his social life throughout high school to varying degrees of sincerity. Perhaps the most earnest of these was Tiffany Gowan, who sat with Christian every day during lunch. It's worth noting that during this time, Chris was extremely naive on relationships and sex. He apparently was unaware of the idea of dating until he turned 21, a testament to his shelteredness. Evidently, the sit-down talk of puberty never came. But where Chris's parents failed, entertainment took its place, a trend that would be recurrent throughout his life. As Chris recalls, after unlocking the parental controls on his television, he accidentally came across a suggestive scene in a film and had his first direction. Part of the known curriculum Chris took that year was a cooking class, evidenced by recovered kitchen safety worksheets he completed. And in the assignment title, Safety First, he notes, What could happen if you plug too many appliances into one outlet? It could start a fire. Christian also took child development classes, which included the activity of simulated parenthood. This is done through a variety of different methods, be it an interactive infant doll, or in Chris's case, an empathy belly, an attachable pregnancy stomach meant to enable students to understand the effects of caring on the child. The belly made it uncomfortable for me to touch my legs. And when my legs entries in the Pokemon franchise were released to the Game Boy in Japan and quickly evolved into a pop culture phenomenon. Within the first two years of its debut, the franchise received its own trading card game and anime series. 
and it wasn't long after this merchandising boom that the phenomenon began taking over the West. Due to the series' popularity, in 1998, the Pokemon TV show made its debut in the United States, with the games following soon after. It's unknown exactly when Chris discovered Pokemon, but when he did, he immersed himself with the universe almost as deeply as Sonic. At the same time as the Poker Craze, Chris was taking Spanish classes in high school, where he often incorporated his love of video games into assignments. In a project dated February 8, 1999, Chris illustrates his Spanish vocabulary by translating the names of characters from both Sonic the Hedgehog and Pokemon. This would be his earliest known reference to the franchise. It was this same month that Chris Chan would celebrate his 17th birthday. To commemorate, he produced a drawing of his character, Bionic the Hedgehog, holding a flag proclaiming, I fought my autism, and I won. This character would later become one of the first entries in his line of original Pokemon cards, eventually amassing enough to create an entire Pokedex, which he dubbed the Law of Origins. Girl, we're telling. Standouts include Chikachu, a female Pikachu who can only deal damage when accompanied by a boyfriend. Flashball, a flashlight Pokemon. Cocupron, a frog made from computer code. And of course, we can't forget Plotistic, a plant that's on the spectrum. As Chris continued to express his fascination with the Pokemon franchise, Plotistic. He the first version of <laughs> Plots is really proud of due to its ability to be pronounced as quick. This web page would only last a few months before being replaced in July by Chris's second, more amateurish focus site developed entirely in Notepad. Entering his final year of high school, Chris began this last hurrah by writing a short Pokemon fanfiction. Titled How the Pokemon Came into Our Pokeballs, it was completed for an English assignment asking students to invent their own myth. Unlike his previous writings, his English teacher actually enjoyed this one. Sometime this same year, Chris also began volunteering at the local Books A Million as an assistant gym leader for their Pokemon Trading Card League. His staffing role was captured in a segment by Richmond NBC affiliate WWBT, showcasing him dressed up at the store as Ash Ketchum. I'll put, I'll put out my dragon there, even though I have 50 family cards. Oh boy. Uh, Jennifer Keown. Brian, what's that? Oh, With the end of the millennia, Christian was the same as he'd ever been. In fact, his obsession with the media was only worsening. He seemingly began showcasing his focus site around school, with various teachers and friends signing his guest book. February of his senior year would be an especially productive month for Christian Weston Chandler. That Valentine's Day, he published a poem to commemorate the event, titled The Valentine's Day Event. Cheerful celebration of another couple's love, this attitude would not last. Just a few days after this, Chris celebrated his 18th birthday. In attendance were Chris's parents, his stepbrother, and his gal pals from school. One gal pals from school. school would interact with them outside the class. He would later reminisce on this being one of the best days of his life. With high school soon coming to a close, this seemed like a great memory to end this chapter of Chris's life on. But it would turn out that's that tiger paralyzes so good in march christian was instructed to create an album cover as an assignment for his computer graphics class one of the restrictions however was that students could not use any copyrighted material given his obsession with pop culture which bled into everything he produced chris struggled with the project's requirement of originality this was when he had an epiphany in order to circumvent the copyrights held by Sega and Nintendo, Christian invented Sonic Chew, a hybrid of the characters Pikachu and Sonic the Hedgehog. He recalls imagining the character after lunch on that fateful day of March 17th. Taking Sonic Chew on paper from imagination, then I drew him on my currently open Photoshop program. Just to check him with Miss Chalice, and my father, who is big on copyrights. Oh, no. Oh no, it's a wolf. Then and still is an old Well, soon after, the city cover was made, printed, and packed with a plush gray. Upon this character, 
after his reception, James will never be the same. Now with his own quote-unquote original creation, Sonic shoots to the forefront of all of his creative endeavors. The next time he created a Sonic shoe sweatshirt and gave it to one of his gal pals as a birthday gift. He also began producing dozens of Sonic shoe variant Pokemon cards. Five months after this, he even launched a Sonic shoe site to succeed his Poké site. And it wasn't long after that, your skill has increased. Oops. His mascot. In May, Chris attended his school senior prom with his mother. Upon arriving, one of his gal pals saw this and felt sorry for him. So she asked him for a dance. So the one with my crowd, but I went there with my mother. Your skill has increased. Your skill has increased. Your skill has increased. Most notable is the City Room, which is an early version of what would later be known as Clickville. It is a miniature city made from the pieces of Chris's various Lego kits and other memorabilia. It was here that he revealed that his family was moving back to their house in Rutgersville. According to Chris, his parents had failed to sell the home and would have stayed in Richmond had they succeeded. On June 15th, Christian graduated from Manchester High School. In spite of placing on the honor roll, for Chris, the celebration was not ceremonious. Before receiving their diplomas, an award ceremony was held to recognize the school's gifted students. Chris became jealous after not being given an award for his art class assignments. During the early award ceremony, I was a little thrilled to get a star for my grade. But then I find out that I'm outshined in my creative skills because those people do not appreciate the time and effort I took into making Sonic Shoes. I was a high-functioning artistic boy who came way beyond out of his social shell, only to get silch, not a sip, a big fat zero. When it came time to actually receive his diploma, Chris went up without making eye I don't understand where this stuff so was. To slap away the presenter's hand when they reached out for a congratulatory handshake. Then ran off and found a table isolated enough to cry alone. It wasn't simply jealousy that had overwhelmed him that day, but rather the realization he was leaving behind the quote, best circle of friends he ever had. As mentioned before, Chris seldom hung out with his gal pals outside of high school, and the end of his time at Manchester largely meant the end of his social life as he knew it. The high school graduation has since become a point of trauma for Chris, as he felt it marked the end of the best years of his life. The thing is, what he remembers from his high school years is an extremely romanticized version of events that didn't include the manipulation those around him participated in to help him make it through. He fondly recalls being an honor roll student. Those teachers often gave him higher grades than he probably deserved. He liked to see himself as an engaged pupil, though slept through many of his classes. He had friendships, but they always seemed to end when the bell rang. Speaking of friends, let's take for example one of Chris's gal pals from middle school, the girl next door who would often hang out with them at the bus stop near their home. Chris interpreted their time together as genuine camaraderie, when in fact she had been paid by Bob to essentially babysit him. On top of this, there has been speculation that his father had a meeting with the principal of Manchester High, which resulted in school staff bringing together upstanding girls in Chris's grade to befriend and protect him from the horrors of high school, meaning that the gal pals were also a result of behind-the-scenes meddling by his parents. It, man, the bag is, like, gone. It's weird. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> when he was still largely getting away with being oblivious to the world, an era where his parents could still feasibly shelter him as he developed an over-reliance on children's entertainment to compensate. And no matter how superficial the relationships were, they still were friendships to him. His gal pals were the one thing standing between Chris and solitude. 
After high school, as Chris had guessed, he'd lose contact with them, but most could have never guessed how far he would descend into isolation. The weather was dark and rainy that graduation day. Adult Chris found himself in his graduation gown. When Barbara and Tiffany found him, they comforted the emotional young man. His father, however, was less forgiving with how his son had behaved. Perhaps he read the writing on the wall then and there and realized the futility of his family's future. high school, Chris finally had the independence that's afforded to adults. With his free time, Chris began volunteering as an assistant Pokemon gym leader at the local Toys R Us trading card club in Charlottesville. According to first-hand accounts, he often attempted to use his homemade Pokemon cards <laughs> in play, which were unbalanced and metallic. Christian also launched SonicChew.com, though it was largely <laughs> His family, now back under the same roof, began attending the newly established Grace Baptist Church. And in August, Chris began his first year at Piedmont Virginia Community College. He was said Why do you guys know so much about him? It's, it's just creepy. friends left behind, he <coughs> found solace in his artwork. And that winter crafted his very first, now iconic, Sonic Gym medallion using Crayola model magic. Originally decorated with a makeshift chain, this was later replaced with a higher quality necklace he bought from the mall. The medallion was intended to serve as a name tag, something that would help him stand out in public. And that December, Chris designed a companion character for Sonic Chew named Rose Chew, a rather blatant derivative of the Sonic character named Rose. In August of 2001, Christian began working his first and to date only conventional job. He was hired at the local Wendy's, but had a difficult time maintaining this employment, only lasting approximately a month and a half before being fired. Unlike high school, the employees at the fast food chain were critical of him and made their frustrations known in a very patronizing manner. The exact circumstances of which he was fired are unclear, though there are two incidents often credited as being the last straw. The first claims that Chris was terminated for drawing a picture of an older female co-worker at the Pokemon, which they found deeply offensive. The second excuse that Chris told himself involved his attempts to entertain a little boy with his parents, where he performed an impression of the character Donald Duck. This scared the child, causing him to cry. It's approximated that Chris earned around $500 from his employment at Wendy's. In June of 2002, he stopped volunteering as a Pokemon gym leader at the local Toys R Us, opting to play at the locally owned hobby shop known as the Game Place every Friday. As Chris proceeded through college, he began to appreciate all the moments he'd taken for granted back in high school. In February of 2003, he wrote the fond accounts of his 18th birthday party a stark contrast to what would happen on his next birthday only two weeks later. That year, on his 21st special day, Chris was reading Peter Robinson's Wednesday's Child for an English class. What made this class memorable was that homosexuality had come up during the discussion, something that Chris thought of as revolting at the time due to his religious beliefs. As a result, he made derogatory comments towards homosexuals and was promptly told to leave. What exactly was said has never been revealed, but Chris himself described them as, quote, exclamations you'd likely hear from a black person in church. Given the punishment, most surmise his assertions must have been rather severe. And after being told to leave, but Chris once again has sat by himself and cried. The only difference this time was that there was no one there to comfort him. Whether or not Chris outright quit the class by choice or was forced to leave is unclear. But this would set a bad precedent for the rest of his college career. This incident would mark the beginning of a new saga in Chris's life. One that would lead him not to just be eventually expelled from his college entirely, but to lose it. It was that day, right after he was ejected from English class, that he began his love quest. You see, since he had no one to console him for the first time in his life, it led Chris to realize that he should pursue a romantic relationship, to fill the now empty hole in his emotional support network. But to discover his soulmate, and perhaps even one day bear his child, he had to go back to the drawing board. Throughout April of 2003, Chris began depicting romance using his 
Sonic drew characters. He created the Hedgehogs and Log Pokemon card before quickly succeeding it with the short story of Sonic 2 and Rose Chew, the genesis of the Lovehogs. The story ends with Sonic 2 and Rose Chew gazing at the moon before locking eyes and sharing <laughs> a passionate kiss. But it wasn't until August that his desperation for intimacy began to materialize in the real world. As Chris entered his fourth year at the two-year community college, he officially began his search for <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. It's deja, it's deja vu. To get the attention of a boyfriend free girl. On it, the reportedly challenged man describes not just himself, but also the qualities he wished for his significant other. One man has shown a white man. Okay. Young at heart. Humorous. Humorous. More exciting good parts of life. Traumatic. Very creative. Two years, 18 to 21, single female companion who is 18 to 21 years of age and does not already have a boyfriend. Average to slender, but that's why. Lives in the Charlottesville or Rutgersville area. Does not smoke or drink alcohol. Happy, positive personality. Average or high income. services approached him, confiscated his sign, and bluntly told him to stop. Chris interpreted her authoritative command as very violent, claiming she had exclaimed, you're not allowed to find true love here. Determined, Chris stubbornly created another attraction sign, only for Mary to confiscate it again a few weeks later. This temporarily led Chris to return to venting his frustrations into his art, at least for the next few months. In November, Chris wrote a poem titled, The Saddest Part in the World. Can we go back to Boys Town? I do my welcome crew. Tell me why I stop as a virgin rage. Tell me why I need to meet a true girl my age. Tell me why I <laughs> it's, 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 it's in sync. Oh, no. Enough 
was enough, it was finally time to put an end to his disobedience. According to Chris, she approached him stating that his posters were bothering both her and the student body. Chris responded that he was on a drug list, prompting her to rip the sign from his hands and tear it apart. She then lectured him, stating he would never get a girlfriend this way before demanding that he stop his behavior immediately. She ended the confrontation by scheduling Chris to attend Your skill has increased. Discuss the string of incidents. On February 1st, Chris initiated an email exchange with Ms. Walsh, attempting to avoid the meeting through a compromise. He promised Fanta. that he wouldn't name any <laughs> so long as she allowed him to continue Your skill has increased. He also assures that he would move her off his scale of respect by two points. About 48 hours later, Ms. Walsh would unequivocally deny his request. Requiring that they meet Your skill has increased. While well, what exactly occurred during this meeting is uncertain, a few key details are known. At one point, Chris talked with Sonic Chu as if he was real, claiming to Miss Walsh that his character communicated through him. This caused the dean of students to talk to Chris, quote unquote, rudely and horribly. In retaliation, nope. Chris stood up, cupped his hands to his side, and thrusted him forward. Climbing a powerful beam of energy, he shouted at the top of his lungs his personal variant of a phrase from the anime Dragon Ball Z that he legitimately believed would bring bad luck to the victim. Unsurprisingly, this did little to move Miss Walsh, who declared a ban on not just his attraction sign, but the distribution of his newsletter as well. This enraged Chris to the point where he privately declared war. Mary Lee Walsh made it illegal to distribute the news there. I am very angry at that. In response, I claim to thank the masses and hopefully demand the return of the news dash so my chances of getting a girlfriend can be restored. Adding fuel to the fire was Mary Lee Walsh's attempts to convince Bob and Barbara to remove Chris from the college. Giving them flashbacks to their conflict with Nathaniel Green, they not only refused, but became extremely upset. During summer break that year, Chris began exploring more locations to loiter at with his attraction sign. Now dubbing them attraction locations, he began standing at the Charlottesville Fashion Square Mall. This would become the testing ground of a new strategy he'd adopted after watching a lot of anime. Essentially, his plan was to attach a paper heart to a piece of red string, and then throw it at women. He would then reel the string back in, expecting them to follow. Unsurprisingly, in less than a week after conceiving the strategy, his plan was foiled when a mall security guard noticed and confiscated the string from him. This would lead Chris to coin the term a jerk cop later abbreviated to jerk off to describe store security officers. His next run-in with mall staff would occur eight weeks into his loiter. This was when the same mall security guard from last time approached him, to which Chris pulled out some of his homemade trading cards that told the story of the lonesome virgin. He later bragged about intimidating the officer by shouting no directly in his face. Only five days later, okay. Chris was approached once again, this time becoming even more belligerent. It escalated to the point of him being detained and forbidden to return from the mall without supervision from his parents. As Chris entered his fifth year at PVCC, he still held resentment towards Miss Walsh in spite of his off-campus pursuits. It was around this point Chris left an inflammatory note for the Dean of Students, expressing his dislike for her. Included was an illustration of an intimidating glare. This, as it would turn out, would be his downfall. Taking into account their previous quarrels, the message was interpreted by the school's administration as a form of harassment. After several hearings deliberating on his fate, the administration ultimately decided it'd be best to temporarily suspend Chris from the campus. Enraged by this development, Bob and Barbara decided to incite the masses themselves, allegedly penning a letter to the White House demanding action. Nothing came of their endeavors, and for the suspension, the criteria for him to return included anger management classes, a psychological evaluation, and social skills counseling. Strangely, it appeared the only reason Chris was upset about his ban was the fact he'd be losing the campus as an attraction zone. It's been over a week since my suspension. I am depressed, lonely, sad, and bored. I have nowhere to go to attract a boyfriend free woman. A boyfriend free woman. Hoping that he will bring me one. While all this was going on, Chris became more invested in the Yu-Gi-Oh trading card game. 
Participating in his first tournament at the game place, it was there that he first met Megan Schroeder, an 18-year-old artist who shared many of the same interests as him. They quickly became friends, as she became Chris's first gal pal since leaving high school. Around this time, Chris attended the psychiatric evaluation he was required by PVCC's administration to receive. As of writing, it is the only objective, independent, professional evaluation of Christian as an adult. Mr. Chandler is a 22-year-old man with a history of developmental delays and autism. Despite these limitations, he seems to be quite successful in maximizing his academic abilities. Despite his significant delays in language, he has over the years developed relatively effective communication skills. He is left, however, with a severe degree of social awkwardness and seems to have good insight into this. He is left feeling somewhat frustrated as he has a strong desire for companionship, although his social limitations prevent him from being able to realize this in the way in which he would like. He has been on antidepressants for many years, and it is not entirely clear what role they play. Based on the information available at this time, the patient doesn't seem to pose a significant threat to himself or anyone else. There are some suggestions that the anger control has been a problem, although how that has manifested itself is unclear. He certainly has no history of physical violence, which would suggest any future risk. Compared to Christian state today, this paints a picture of a man that was still, relatively speaking, at the beginning of his descent. A time when he was more lonely than in high school, but still frequently went outside and had modest social interaction at the game place. It's worth noting that the examiner concluded that Chris should receive further treatment, advice that his parents seemed to ignore. With a tumultuous home life accompanied by years of a society Chris felt he was weighed down by, the self-described virgin with rage decided to get <laughs> and pick up his pen. With all he had learned and experienced, it was at this point he would create what is now seen as his magnum opus, the Sonic Chew comics. Not only did this series become his masterpiece, but more importantly brought attention his way. While up until this point he was known only by those in his local vicinity, soon enough a little image board would stumble upon his work and in the process make internet history as Christian yeah, Weston Chandler becomes TV. possibly the most notable person in the history of the World Wide Web. Yeah. Uh, is, there, is there anything else? Uh, what, would you, what would you like to Oh do? my or god. Like maybe want to go to McDonald's or something like that or to hang out in the gazebo maybe? Um, well, it's dark out now it so is. might not I'm not be able to see the gazebo. That's true. But I can point out, it's, uh, you know, behind the house, and you, you know where the pen is, the green of the fence right at the, that's alongside the road there? Uh, and I then, what? Yeah. Oh, Why does he have boobs? Uh, you're driving down Westwood. Right. And uh, you look to your right. You see it, you will see a dog house before you see the... <laughs> I could not live I could not live with those dogs. I couldn't do it. It would drive me crazy crazy. I like David Ber Berkowitz crazy. Those, those dogs would definitely drive me crazy. Very low gazebo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Watch your head if you're oh. I'm I'm able to I'm able to stand barely. At five ten. Yeah. If you're Brad Garrett, you would have to hunch down. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, the start card is essentially the author or centerpiece of the whole fan fiction. Twilight Spark was the Christian is Equestria's most prolific and horrific fanfic author. She ships herself, her friends, and her family together regardless of relation, orientation, or harmonious name and coat color combination. In order to help fulfill Twilight's dream of writing the perfect fanfic, she takes turns at spanning the shipping grid, joining new ponies with ship cards. If you are at first to make one of Twilight's narrative goals a reality, and you earn the points for that goal, of course, you also earn the shame of enabling Twilight's horrible pretensions of shipping a friend, but nobody's perfect. <laughs> the goals that we want to achieve on the shipping grid, in which in this case we start off with fulfilling a prophecy, we ship uh, any sign at you with the prime keyword with uh, Chris Chan or Christine Chan. We get that, or we get three unicorn sh ships on the gr unicorn on unicorn ship. So that's, you know. Where's my daddy? What kind of uh, animal? Si he's a sign chip. And each player gets four ponies and three ships. That's their starting hand. Each player plays at least one card from your hand at the end of the turn. All pony cards closely shipped. As in, you know, attached with the ship card. You can have uh, keywords. They cannot uh, be swapped either or moved from card grid by card or text. text. Yeah. And, and all pony cards shipped with that one cannot be lost on card. On the card. Card. So, so, so those two are not the same. Everybody needs to have BCB. Cards at least don't be too much. Yeah, I told you it gets crazy. Using his Sonic Chu character, which he created in high school, Chris began to expand his fictional worlds, added new characters, and got to work in making a comic to tell their stories. And in March of 2005, Sonic Chu number zero was released onto Chris's website, with the now iconic cover of Christian telling his creation to go out and zap to the extreme. It also boasted that the publication was hand-drawn, a fact that Chris clearly took great pride in. This is because while most webcomics are drawn digitally using a tablet, Chris did not have access to that sort of equipment, forcing him to draw on printer paper with pencils and markers. The art in Sonic Chu was crude and amateurish, which of course became one of its most defining features over time. On top of that, there were frequent spelling and grammatical errors, another staple of his work. Sonic Chu did not tell one story per issue. Instead, each installment was broken up into several smaller tales, referred to as episodes. Episode 1, titled Sonic Chu's Origin, explained how the titular character came to be. As the story went, while fighting the monster Perfect Chaos, Sonic the Hedgehog collided with a nearby Pikachu that was watching the battle, transforming it into Sonic Chu. Meanwhile, a beam of rainbow energy hit a Raichu 50 miles away, causing it to evolve into a new form. The Raichu's trainer, a girl named Kel, stated that her Pokemon looked as beautiful as a rose, leading her to choose the name Rose Chu. This episode was one of the earliest examples of Chris's poor understanding of copyright law. Despite the fact that he needed the Sonic Chu character to claim parody, he still tied his backstory in with intellectual property that he did not own. However, this did not stop Chris from putting his own copyright notice on the comic. At the end of episode one, Chris took readers the on a small tour through his fictional town of Quickville, of which he was the, the mayor, and introduced them to the cast of characters they would be meeting in future issues. At the very end of this section, Chris introduced himself, where he included the uniquely Chris Chan line, I am also single, lonely, and I need a girlfriend. Episode 2 was an adaptation of Chris's old story, Genesis of the Love Hogs, telling the tale of Sonic Chu and Rose Chu meeting each other and falling in love. Episode 3 was titled Sonic Chu vs. Nate Surf, and introduced a new villain for the story, which is Christian's name spelled backwards. He was the son of Giovanni, the leader of Team Rocket from Pokemon. Chris portrayed Nate Surf as being what he felt was the complete opposite of himself, evil and flamboyant and gay. The epilogue of this first issue shows Chris lamenting over the continued failure of his love quest and driving back to the Fashion Square Mall to continue his search for a sweetheart. Strangely, in this encounter, Sonic Chu referred to Chris as his father. 
Chris also provided the readers with a few short Sonic Juice strips he had drawn before beginning work on the comic proper. These really didn't amount to anything important, but they are notable for being the first appearance of a new villain known as Mary Lee Walsh, who you might remember as the Dean of Student Affairs at Piedmont, Virginia Community College. The fictional Mary Lee Walsh's goal was to keep Chris from completing his love quest, mirroring how her real-life counterpart repeatedly forbade Chris from carrying his attraction sign around the campus, portraying her with a pitchfork and devil horns and ending the comic by obliterating her with his cursy Hameha attack. As you can probably already tell, Chris often incorporated his real-life struggles into his work. Another example being a jerk cop catastrophe, which involved him hanging around <laughs> the hall, listening to music on his Nintendo DS, and expressing his frustration over the fact that all the women he wanted to date were already in relationships. As he pondered his unfortunate reality, Chris was approached by a jerk cop who berated him for <laughs> his loneliness. This security guard then brought in reinforcement to handcuff him, but our hero was able to escape by transforming into his new form known as Chris Chan Sonic Chu, using his famous medallion. This appears to be the first ever use of his now famous moniker, Chris Chan. As Mr. Chandler began writing his comic, so too did he continue his love quest at the Fashion Square Mall. Now under the supervision of his parents, following prior confrontations with the jerk he would spend hours pacing around carrying his attraction sign, hoping a girl would approach him. Eventually, Chris did attract the attention of women, though probably not the kind of attention he was hoping to. The first of these ladies was a 19-year-old named Anna McLaren, who detailed her experience with Chris in a blog post titled The Tale of the Crazy Pacer. According to Chris, <laughs> a 27-year-old autistic man making his rounds while she was at work, and he would occasionally glance through the window the crazy and pacer. look at her along with fellow female employers. On a dare, Anna began to wave at Chris as he walked by, which quickly escalated when he entered the store to talk to her. He attempted to flirt, and she responded as politely as she could before the conversation ended with Chris giving Anna his email address. Despite the circumstances of how they met, the teenager would go on to become one of Chris's longest-running real-life acquaintances after this encounter. The second of Chris's love Your skill has increased. was a young woman named Hannah in March of 2005. While he was taking a break from his search for a boyfriend-free girl, she reportedly agreed with Chris and asked him out on a date. This made the autistic man ecstatic, believing that his years of carrying an attraction sign had It's paid off, off, guys. It's paid, it paid off. He tell everybody he knew about this exciting development, and that included his new friend Anna McLaren. However, she knew something Chris didn't. Anna had no intention of dating him and had merely asked him out as a prank. Chris was shocked by this revelation and immediately went to confirm it with Hannah. Upon admitting to what she had done, Chris was devastated and loudly yelled, No! In the middle of the mall. This disturbance earned Chris yet another temporary ban. These events were retold in his Sonic 2 comic, The Rise and Fall of My Heart. In this version, Anna's role was replaced by Rose Chu, and perhaps more notably, Chris's emotional state was visually portrayed by a heart level. It begins with him at 20%, but when Hannah asks him out, it skyrockets all the way up to 100%. However, when her cruel trick is revealed, it plummets back down to 15. Throughout many Sonic 2 issues, Chris had drawn ads to replicate the look of a real publication. The most notable of these was the ad for Axe Body Spray in Sonic 2 number 2. He made no secret about his love for the product, likely buying into its ad campaign that showed its wearers being irresistible to women. Chris states that Axe makes him feel quote-unquote simply delicious and confident. However, the main concern is found in Sonic 2 and Rose Chu's conversation near the bottom of the page, which seems to imply that Chris believes wearing Axe is a suitable replacement for bathing. It also includes Rose Chu asking the baffling question, May I orbit your belt? As the Sonic 2 comics continued, Chris introduced his childhood friend Sarah Hammer as a character, as well as her boyfriend at the time, Wes Eisley. In the story, the three of them are all 
given the ability to transform into hedgehog versions of themselves. Chris makes no secret about his jealousy towards Wes, writing him as a villainous character and another one of his many personal rivals. He dedicates an entire page to a discussion between the two, in which Chris talks about how Jealous he felt during an incident in which he saw Sarah sitting on Wes's lap. In this confrontation, Chris portrays himself as very honest and mature, while Wes comes across as cruel and selfish. As you've probably been able to figure out at this point, these episodes were Chris's main way of coping with his problems. Rather than try to learn from his mistakes, he would instead take no personal responsibility and create his own reality in which he was the victim, and the world was out to get him. Because of this, similar situations of Chris having run-ins with others such as law enforcement would happen over and over, with him seemingly learning nothing each time. However, this eventually came to an end around mid-2005, when Chris's mother Barbara told him to stop adding these personal details to his comics, since she wasn't fond of the idea that their personal life would be shared on the internet. Chris agreed, and decided to officially end the autobiographical subsections with Sonic 2 No. 4 in September, a compilation of all the previous personal sections of his work, as well as a few new ones. Funnily enough, Sonic 2 No. 4 was released almost six months before Sonic 2 No. 3. The first of this final batch of real-life reenactments was the two-part story Nick Attack, in which Chris had been kicked out of a McDonald's for loitering allegedly once again trying to do his old attraction sign trick. In true Chris Chan fashion, this retelling portrays the managers as aggressors while Chris is simply an innocent victim. By most angles, Mick Attack is fairly standard as far as early Sonic 2 goes. However, there is one element that makes it stand out. About halfway through the story, Chris summons his twin sister Crystal to help him in the battle. Of all the bizarre creations that were spawned in the Sonic 2 universe, Crystal ranks amongst the strangest, and her inclusion in the story confused many. You see, most of his characters have a real-life counterpart, but Chris didn't have a sister. Many theorize that Crystal represented a female version of Chris, since in Mick Attack, Crystal stands up to the managers who are harassing her. Sonic 2 No. 4 concludes with the story of Off Target. This was Chris's dramatic retelling of a real-life incident that happened in July, in which he was once again confronted by jerk-offs while carrying around his attraction sign, but this time in Target. Unlike most of the other events of this nature, things quickly escalated to the point of the police being called. Chris ended up getting arrested and charged with disorderly conduct and trespassing, although these charges were dropped after two court hearings. Nonetheless, this event obviously traumatized the entire Chandler family. Despite his mother's wishes, Chris continued to write about his real life frequently in his comics, though just not as on the nose as before. Sonic 2 No. 5 focused once again on Chris and his never-ending love quest containing the story of the recent wedding of Sarah Hammer to a man named William Spicer. While it's laid out in rather confusing terms, the dialogue in this episode states that Chris is only attending the wedding in spirit, implying that he was not invited. However, an image does exist of Chris and Sarah posing with her wearing a veil, seemingly meaning that even if he was not at the wedding, he saw her shortly before or afterward. While obviously nothing can be said for certain, Chris seems happy for Sarah in the picture, and that is reflected in the comic. The story is actually fairly mature by Chris's standards, as he lets go of his crush and accepts that they will not end up together. Upon this issue's release, it seems that Christian was actually making progress, although that may be due to the fact he had his sights set on a new potential sweetheart. As one door closed, another seemed to be opening as the comic ends with Chris catching the bouquet as Sarah throws it, traditionally meaning he will be the next to get married. Coincidentally, in this story, Chris also introduced a new character, Sailor Megaton, and in the very beginning of the comic, he credits her creation to his friend, Megan Schroeder. Hello, my name is Chris Watson Chandler, the Rockefeller, Virginia. What can you do for me, Well, I'll do it for a PS3. I tell you what I do. Well, if I had the money, I'd pay the line. I don't let people give me their tents and all that good stuff. I throw away the key.
except for autism, if I had it. As briefly mentioned in the previous episode, Chris met a woman named Megan a few years prior at the game place. But he appeared to have recently been making efforts to grow their friendship into something more. Since the young woman was a fan of Sailor Moon and My Little Pony, Chris decided to get into those franchises as well. For this brief moment in time, it seemed like Chris was actually evolving as a person, accepting that his previous crush had moved on and began taking a genuine interest in his new potential sweetheart's hobbies. But unfortunately, this would not last. The 20-some-year-old man went overboard and started spending copious amounts of money on toys and merchandise for Megan's favorite IP. Unrelated, he also began buying adult DVDs and toys, including a blow-up doll. It's important to keep in mind that at this point, Chris was unemployed, with his only source of income coming from monthly social security payments. During this time, Megan was fully aware of Chris's interest in her. He would reportedly often try to touch her without consent, a problem she would bring up in an email to Chris. One more thing. Please minimize your touchiness. You know well I dislike it, and I keep reminding you. Understand, I'm not angry, but annoyed and a bit disappointed. I remember you said you'd never do it again, and yet I know you're just being friendly and all, but I really hate being touched by anyone. The young lady was clearly trying to nip this crush in the bud, but Christopher would not listen. This would, of course, eventually blow up in his face. But Chris had a few more heartbreaks to go through before that happened. On June 27, 2006, Chris's beloved dog, Caddy, tragically passed away. She was quite old, as the canine had joined the Chandler family all the way back in 1992, and her worsening health problems made them finally decide it was time to put her out of her misery. In Chris's eulogy for his pet, he stated that he was the one who signed the paper authorizing the vet to put Caddy to sleep, in order to spare his mother the burden. I raised Caddy since she was a six-week-old pup. And I wanted to take the strain for signing the one-way ticket. It was hard for me, but I wished for the best. So I signed that paper with a crying smile to Craig saying, We love you, Patty. After that, I begged for my final kiss, hug, hands of all hold, eye contact, air rub, cheek to fur rub, and I sadly waved her for the last time. And I said, Good night, Patty. I love you. After a small funeral, Patty Chandler was buried in the backyard, underneath the doghouse that had been her home for so many years. Chris's eulogy may have been the most heartfelt thing he had ever written. They had essentially grown up together, and an argument could have been made that Patty was the closest and most long-lasting friendship Chris ever had. In February of 2007, Sonic 2 number 6 was released, containing the episode One Lucky Dog. It tells the story of Patty eating some magical grass and transforming into a talking anthropomorphic dog-slash-human hybrid. Upon discovering this, Chris takes Patty into his bedroom, where he reveals that he had a portal God to his damn fictional it. <clears throat> town of Cookville hidden within the closet. He takes his I think I've got to do the, kin the Kinesh tour again. Which is so annoying. Hey guys, welcome to another video. Today we're going over one of the fastest ways to level your caves and make a ton of gold at the same time. This is an easy method to follow and even new players can use it to stack up hundreds of gold and level their caves. And we'll be starting off in the dude. If you want to make a lot of gold while leveling your caves, first head to the Animal Librarian near the Butchery Table in town. Then buy the Incisium Law Book for 2 gold and 50 silver and begin learning. This will enable you to get Incisium when you butcher the carcasses you're going to get, and Incisium is very valuable to players. One stack of Incisium goes for 30 to 50 gold or even more in the Dooley alone, and you can take back 5 or 6 stacks with you on one run if you'd like. Make sure you have some basic armor, a long bow, a short bow as well, with a few hundred arrows for each type, some bandages, and some tools.
friend Nash, is it? No, it's like, uh, Yeah. I know everyone who works in here from City Field. First off, what Spanish has to offer? Our two crescent tables sell armor, wool, butcher, shield, and weapons. Also sell crescent tools like the cupola, the grinder, the clearing. And also note the Napuros and the Alpen tables. There's no weapon vendor here. And some very important NPCs. Like the banker, the cooking vendor, the grocery vendor, the leaching vendor, and the utility vendor. Spanish is located in the north side of the map, near Fabenon. Spanish is also more centered in the map than it was in Mortal Online 1. Here you can see the Fabenon Tower, and here you can see the Tumblen Walls. The view is just amazing, but the, the travels are very dangerous because of no guards, of course, but also because of outlaws and bandits. God damn it. Uh, I'm going to have to make a spear and I don't remember how. Uh, I did it once, but I really don't remember. But I'll have to make a spear and then that's definitely something. So, shield crafting, armor, bow head equipment crafting librarian finish banker shield bow armor weapon I can make daggers and swords that's it I guess I could learn daggers until I, until I could earn enough money to make a, a I guess I, uh, I guess I can learn how to make spears, the crafting librarian. Crafting spearheads. Crafting pole blades. Let's see if I can get a guide on how to make a spear. Hand handle and pole crafting. is defeated. The spearhead can be can be constructed out of cuprum. Let's see if there's a video about it. I can kind of walk myself through the process, but the
There's there's my build. Okay. Uh, this other one had good good information. Emulge is the the spearhead can be structured out of cuprum, so I need crafting spearheads, which is two gold fifty. Uh, and that sucks, but I guess I'll have to. But it is something I can do, which is cool. Two gold fifty. It'll be a while. And I'll need wood and I mean I guess I could use like the the pickaxe I guess it does no damage but it's better than nothing I guess I mean, I guess I can make a weapon and level the weapon while I get the other materials, I guess. So, god damn it, this annoys me how they built that. A one handed sword, sword, that's fine. I have a crafting level of 27. Tiger. Oops. Ah. Uh. Thank you, Jonah Vale Crafting, for the excellent content for my stream. I'd like to sub to your channel. Hello again, and welcome to our latest installment in the More Online 2 Newbie Guide series. Today, after many requests, we'll be diving into crafting, one of Mortal's most robust systems. I do want to preface this video by saying that while crafting is in-depth for Mortal, I am more or less not an expert at it. The purpose of this video will be to teach you the basics and leave discovery and wonder to you. So again, this is going to be a very top-down broad video to get you started, but let's get into it. Now, if you want to be mostly a crafter, that's what you want to focus on. Your race and stats play a large part of it. The two best clades for crafting will be Ogmir and Human. Human gets solid extra clay gifts that help them with numerous and other crafting skills, as well as solid attribute point spread. Osmeers get a lot of solid crafting and refining perks, and can also get very, very high intelligence, which brings me to my next point. Intelligence is the most crucial stat when it comes to crafting. With high intelligence, you'll gain attribute skill points to most crafting skills, which will give you extra points to put into more primary crafting skills. In a perfect world, I would lean towards a very high end based mage as my crafter. Once you have your character mapped out, it's time to get down to business. This guide will assume we're starting our adventure in Haven, but keep in mind, most mid to late game materials will not be available in Haven, as well as many specialized crafting books that you will need to seek out in the world. The basic premise for crafting is as follows. Find materials, bring materials back to town, refine, if necessary, materials at town, and then craft items out of the materials. 
I'll assume it's because we watched our previous newbie guide to Haven, so I'll pick up a bit from there. You may notice zombies, and most animals, drop carcasses and other materials. But here we can see walking dead carcass is the primary material they drop. But then its base form is extremely heavy. Sometimes while we're farming, we'll need to butcher or cook materials to conserve weight. Simply right click and hold down to butcher. In the bottom left, we can see we learned a bunch of skills. Let me pull this up. So we gained a new skill, skinning knife, new skill, zoology, new skill, mammalia, embarcanta, primata, simia, material lore, animal material, skeleton lore, endoskeleton, and bone tissue lore, and then our butchery skill and extraction went up. These processes, you're going to need to max the lures with the respective materials. You're using, they hit the use key on the fish. Using the butcher table also increased our lures of what seemed to we can see it produce the same materials plus a new material, a mulch. Using the butcher table also increased our lures at what seemed to be an accelerated rate. Another way to increase your lure of materials or animals is by cooking their carcasses. To cook, press L under the profession tab, click show all skill icons, drag the cooking pot to your bar, and then press the button. Here we'll add the walking dead meat and hold to cook. Now, we already had our material lore and our endoskeleton lore at max, so we didn't gain any lore from that, but we did gain cooking skill. I know it asked for a cooking tool here, but that's not necessary for the purpose of just gaining lore. Crafting items in this game can sometimes take only one material or multiple materials for each different part. We're going to skip ahead in this video and I'm going to chop some trees in Haven as well as mine some granite rocks. Once we have a steady base of both, we'll go to the crafting table to see what we can put together. While mining, we brought everything to the crusher to grind it into materials. We noticed there's a, a spot for a catalyst. Catalysts in World Online 2 are used to increase the yield of your refinement uh, or you know, any other thing like at the furnace or anything like that. say that the values is, is percentage based on catalysts, but I, however, do not know these calculations, and some of them are not currently working. The, the only catalyst I can really give an example of would be water and rock oil. So it's going to be up to you to figure those out and figure out what gives you more results. After hitting different trees and crushing granite rock, we have a bunch of different materials available to us, but some of them need to be broken down further. Amarantum and blood ore, for example, will need to use the furnace to refine. Let's go to the furnace with materials and see what we can do. Add the amaranthum, hold the start extraction. We don't know how to operate it. Okay, so we don't know how to use this workbench. Doesn't look like any of this is gonna work. Okay. So we're probably gonna have to learn some books. Make sure we go to the tutor first to get the basic stuff. Okay. It seems we don't have the knowledge to use the furnace. Let's grab some of our gold from the zombie heads and head to the library to see what books we can learn. Here we're at the extraction librarian. And we have the use key on her. We can see furnace operation. We're gonna assume this is what we need, but let's double check and make sure there's not any prerequisites that we need first. We press L to open our skills and type furnace. So we can see we need to learn thermal appliances and then furnace operation. We'll buy both of these. Learn thermal appliances. And then once this levels up, we'll learn furnace operation and go back to the furnace. Now we've learned furnace operation. Let's smelt some of this material down. We're gonna try amarantum first. And remember, if we knew the catalyst, we could get extra on our yield. We go up to it, hold down our use key. And then hold to start to extract. Just like the crusher, it has a timer based on the amount that we are uh, refining. And here we can see our results. We got electrum, Cuprum, calamine, and black. 
Now let's try to melt the blood ore. Since your is too advanced for you to learn, maybe you should do some research. Which brings me to my next point. Not only do you need to sometimes learn books to learn how to use certain uh, appliances, but you also need to sometimes acquire lore via books to work with materials. Let's go back to the library and see if we can find a book on blood ore. At the library, we're going to go to the material lore librarian and look for blood ore. We can see it's here. Before we dive into that, let's check for prerequisite skills. So we can see in order to learn blood ore lore, you would have to have mineralogy. So we'll get the mineralogy. Learn that first. Once that is up, we will learn the blood ore and then go back to the furnace. Now that the furnace was learning blood ore, we'll attempt to smelt it. After smelting the blood ore, we can see we got pig iron. This is the new material we can use to craft. After refining all these mats, let's take as many as we can from our bank and go see what we can craft. Now that we're at the weapon crafting station, we can see all we know how to make are daggers and one-handed swords. I'm looking for more of a two-hander. Back to the librarian. Now we're back to the library. This time at the crafting library. We want to make a two-hander. So let's open our <coughs> and see what we need. We already have the prerequisite one-hand blade hilt crafting, but we might need to raise this. So I think we're going to need two-hand blade hilt crafting. Your skill has increased. Let's see if it allows us to use it. So, as we thought, we're going to need to raise up the other one a little bit higher because it requires more of it. So, we'll buy the one hand blade hilt. Get use on that for this to go up. As we can see, though, even with these increased gains we're currently under, the book raises very slowly. Ideally, you'll be leveling your crafting by making inferior weapons until your skill is higher. Let's go craft some of these to see some gains. Now we're back at the weapon crafting table. We will select swords one-handed. Let's hit the hilt to be right. I like the guard hilt. Let's do apple wood. Then the grip has to be leather. About a bang. And then what about for the head? Let's try bone tissue. I don't know what any of these do. Okay, we can see that raised our skill much quicker than reading the book. It got us to 58. Let's craft another one. And so here, when you hover over it, you can see the stats. This was the first one when our skill was lower, right? Warp drive. And then as we gain material lore or the skills of what we're crafting, the, the shape and the blade, this is the next craft. So we see we went up about five durability and then about 1.1 on the damage. And we can see the quality. It was bad quality and now it's poor quality. So when you're raising your crafting game, you're going to have to make a lot of garbage before you make the good stuff. Short blade crafting. Okay. Docking permission now, requested. We should have enough skill to learn two-handers. Docking request accepted. So let's crank out some two-handers. Let's do the same materials. for 
Mr. Andrews. Back to the librarian. All right. So after going back to the craft librarian, we should have everything to make two hand swords. We need basic blade crafting, advanced blade crafting, and then great blade crafting. Have those over here. I'll speed this up and then we'll get right into it. <clears throat> we finally have great blade crafting learned. Let's see what we can make. Gonna open up the crafting table, two handed swords. What do we like? I like the ring. Let's do the same we did before. Presets. So if I want to just raise my skills, I can do this. Skill Razor. <laughs> I should name it Skill Razor. All right, done. <clears throat> might be, oh god my my voice is fucking dead might might be useful to uh different blades do different things different handles do different things uh you're gonna need to mix and match and see you know what does what it might it might be useful to uh learn how to swing this pickaxe the, at at, uh, at pigs I can't go to Fabernum. I've been locked out of Tindrum. Yeah, that's okay. This is a, this is the experience I wanted. Like how to carve a like a like a fucking a, a living out of the side of the uh, out of the world. systems we just discovered are going to be the same for applying to all crafting. I will digress that alchemy is going to be much more complex and much more in depth. The reason I'm not going into depth on all these systems is because that's not what this guide is about. Finding a special monster, bringing back its spoils will often produce equipment way beyond your imagination. It's up to you to figure out how to best use those materials. Will you be a merchant who sells their crafted goods, a smith who supplies an army for war, or a hunter that just wants to be self-sufficient? It's all up to you. I hope this guide was enough to get you on your feet with crafting and roll on land too. If you have any comments, make sure to leave them below. Thanks again, and this is Jonah Vale signing out. Godspeed, my doobies.
that the axe will kill something. It's just it'll take forever. I thought I saw pigs over here. Let's see if I can go kill some pigs with this axe. See how hard it is. I mean, ah, back to tab, damn it. No, 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 no. You fucked me up here. It's so annoying. Move. You move, damn it. It was as if you had a wall. What? Cheater. Uh. Firmwood. <laughs> Firmwood. I think I can sell this to the market and it might actually be worth a lot, but and that might be the first place to start. Is just fill fill orders so I have gold so I can do things, but I don't know what I would do right now other than begin the training to make a spear. Uh yeah, I have I have uh wood. Yeah. So we'll just put this in the bank for now. Or, well, I thought there was a butcher table. The refining oven. I don't know, I can't do anything like that, but yeah. Let's look around for a charm. There. trade broker let's go see what the wood is worth just so the trade broker to get an idea of what one tree is worth uh this was two go two gold one one tree was two gold that's very very worth it awesome so yeah that's that's really good that, that i can buy books doing that so we can we can we can scratch our living out of the out of the side of the world that's all good uh very good No matter what, like that way, no matter what, I can always just like keep on farming or whatever. Yep. I like the rust, rust kind of treat, uh, train, trains you how to be good in this. Damn it, I feel like I'm dehydrated.
last beer about 8 a.m. in the morning morning beer so that's good to know so we go back chopping more trees should I could even chop a tree in the town maybe really frankly yeah there's like a tree right there I can just chop it frankly why not Yeah, like right in the fucking town who cares I have the, I have, I have, the, I have the town to myself so yeah I can even turn it down like that that sound annoys me I can even just basically mute it Two percent. Yep, two percent's perfect. That way it's like not too annoying and not too obtrusive. <laughs> 